Section twenty one point five, the Hartree-Fock self-consistent field method. For many electron atoms, such as helium, lithium, beryllium, the Schrodinger equation can be solved iteratively and approximately using the self-consistent field method. For example, let's solve the Schrodinger equation for the hydrogen for the helium atom. These two terms are the kinetic energy of the two electrons. Attraction, repulsion between the two electrons. This is the Laplacian. We can expand this Laplacian in terms of r, theta, and phi. The difficult part of solving this equation lies in this term, r one two. R one two is the distance between electron one and electron two. R one two is the square root of the sum of these three terms. X one minus X two squared, Y one minus Y two squared, and Z one minus Z two squared. There's no easy way to separate the coordinates of electron one from the coordinates of electron two. So we have to make approximations to solve this Schrodinger equation. Again, this is the Schrodinger equation of the helium atom in the atomic units. We can solve this by Making approximations, we can somehow turn this equation for two electrons into two Schrodinger equations, one for each electron. So let's look at these two Schrodinger equations, one for each electron. Over here, this is the kinetic energy for electron one. This is the potential energy electron one feels. Together, that's the Hamiltonian for electron one. So we can say this is our H one. We apply the、uh, Hamiltonian to phi one, the wave function for electron one. We get epsilon one phi one. So this is the energy of electron one. This is the wave function for electron one. And we write out a similar equation for electron two. Again, kinetic energy for electron two, effective potential energy for electron two. This is the wave function for electron two, the energy of electron two. So why do we need this so-called effective potential energy operator here? Well, this is because we are not certain about the repulsion between two, the two electrons. Well, we are certain about the attraction operator for electron one. That's simply negative two over r one. So over here, this is attraction. But about the rotation,、uh, about the Repulsion energy between the two electrons.、Uh, we are not certain about that. We、we'll、have to make some approximation. That's why we call this effective potential energy. So, how do we come up with the expression of the effective potential energy operator for electron one here, and then for electron two here? Well, it's a little tricky. First. We need to know what's the total wave function of the two electrons. We use the determinantal form. Again, this is the normalization factor. Don't worry about this too much. And this is a determinantal form for the two electron system. If you have three electrons, then you need to make a three by three determinant. If you have four electrons, make a four by four determinant. The electrons are just one, two, three, four, four rows for four electrons. And then you need to come up with four atomic orbital functions: phi one, phi two, phi three, phi four. Again, if you have a four electron system. So right now we are looking at the helium atom. There are only two electrons, so we have only two rows: electron one, electron two, and we have only two columns: phi one and phi two. Well, again, you can expand this. If you expand this, it's going to be just phi one of one times phi two of two minus phi one of two times phi two of one. That's the total wave function of the two electrons. We use the determinantal form to ensure this wave function is anti-symmetric, and then we can come up with the expression for the effective potential energy operator for electron one. So this is the attraction electron one feels, and over here this is the repulsion energy operator for electron one. This part is the exact 
repulsion operator. All right, but unfortunately, this R12 contains the coordinates of both electron one and electron two. Our goal is to have this equation for electron one only, and this equation contains the coordinates of electron two only. So ideally, this term, this effective potential energy for electron one, should not contain the coordinates of electron two. Again, this effective potential energy operator for electron one should not contain the coordinates of electron two. How can we get rid of the coordinates for electron two? We do have the coordinates of electron two here in this term, in this R one two term. But if we do this integral, we can eliminate the coordinates of electron two. Look, we can integrate. This is psi star. This is psi、uh, in the middle. We have the repulsion energy operator, but if we integrate this with respect to the coordinates of electron two, we can eliminate the coordinates of electron two. So this integral is a function of the coordinates of electron one only. It does not contain the coordinates of electron two. Similarly, the effective potential energy operator for electron two. Is the attraction electron two fields plus this again effective repulsion energy operator? Okay, the exact repulsion energy operator is just one over R one two. We cannot use that because one over R one two contains the coordinates of both the electron one and electron two, and we have to separate the coordinates of electron one from the coordinates of electron two. So. This is the trick. We take the integral of psi star, and this is the repulsion energy operator times psi, and then we integrate this with respect to the coordinates of electron one. And this is the trick to get rid of the coordinates of、uh, electron one. So again, let me give you a, a simple example. If you integrate、um, x y、uh, d y, you will remove. Uh, this uh, a variable y after you do the integration again. If you integrate x y d y, and the y is from zero to one, and then、uh, the result is x times one half y squared, and y is from zero to one, so the result is one half x. So again, the integral of x y d y from zero to one is simply half x. We removed the coordinates. Oh,、uh, we removed the variable y. In that integral, okay. Again, if you integrate something, a function with respect to a variable y, you get rid of that y. In here, we integrate this with respect to the coordinates of electron one. We get rid of the coordinates of electron one. So we ensured this effective potential energy operator contains the coordinates of only electron two. All right, so that way we will be able to write out two Schrodinger equations, one for each electron. And over here, this operator is a y-electron operator. This is also a y-electron operator. And theoretically, we can solve this Schrodinger equation for one electron. Again, theoretically, it's possible to solve the Schrodinger equation for only one electron. We can do that for electron one. We can do that for electron two, and we get epsilon one. We get epsilon two. Epsilon one is the energy of electron one. Epsilon two is the energy of electron two. But epsilon one plus epsilon two is not the total energy of the helium atom. I need to remind you that. This is because in epsilon one,、uh, we count the repulsion between the two electrons. In epsilon two, again, we count. The repulsion between the two electrons. So, if you simply sum up epsilon one and epsilon two,、uh, you will count the repulsion between the two electrons twice. So, the total energy of the two electrons should be epsilon one plus epsilon two minus the repulsion between the two electrons. Okay, let's get back to this iterative algorithm or a self-consistent field method. We do not know phi one or phi two before we can solve these two equations, right? So we have to solve these two equations to get phi one and phi two. But before we can solve these equations, we need to know 
this effective potential energy operator. And how can we get this effective uh, potential energy operator? We need to know the total wave function. To know the total wave function, we need to know phi 1 and phi 2 because we use phi 1 and phi 2 to construct the total wave function of the two electrons. So again, we need phi 1 and phi 2 to make psi. Right? We need psi to make uh, V effective. And we need V effective to solve the short equation for electron 1 to get phi 1. And then solve another equation to get phi 2. So it seems that we are stuck. The trick is we can make an educated guess of phi 1 and phi 2. For example, if you have the helium atom, I would say, well, maybe we can make a guess. Phi 1 is e to the power of negative r1. Or phi 2 is e to the power of negative uh, r2. Or you can say phi 1 is uh, e to the power of negative 2 r1. Phi 2 is e to the power of negative 2 phi 2. Or if you know the effective nuclear charge for the electrons in helium, which is 1.69, and then you can make a more reasonable initial guess. Phi 1 is e to the power of negative 1.69 r1. Phi 2 is e to the power of negative 1.69 r2. So something like that. But anyway, you just need to make a, a reasonable guess of phi 1 and phi 2 just to start this iterative algorithm. Now, if you have phi 1 and phi 2, um, or just the guess of phi 1 and phi 2, and then you can somehow obtain the effective potential energy operator. By doing what? By doing this. If you take a guess of phi 1 and phi 2, plug them in here, you make the total wave function of the two electrons, and then by using these two equations, you get the expression of the effective potential energy operator for electron 1 and for electron 2. And then you plug these two operators here and here. And then you can solve these two shortening equations again. And then to get a new set of phi 1 and phi 2. So that's here. Use effective potential energy operator for electron 1 and the effective potential energy operator for electron 2 to solve these two one electron shortening equations to obtain a new set of phi 1 and phi 2. Again, these two equations are for only one electron, so it's doable. It's possible to solve a one electron shorting equation. So once you do that, you get a new set of phi 1 and phi 2. Very likely, this phi 1 and phi 2 are different from your initial guess. That's fine. You just use the new set of phi 1 and phi 2 to construct a new total wave function of the two electrons. Again, this is a determinant. It's right here. So you plug the new set of phi 1 and phi 2 here. You make a new wave function for the two electrons. And then plug in the function psi here and here, here and here. You get two new effective potential energy operators for electron 1 and electron 2. And then solve these two equations again. And then you get your third set of phi 1 and phi 2. And plug it back into the psi again. You just repeat step 2. Step 3, step 4, eventually your effective potential energy operators converge. And um, this corresponds to the electric field, the two electrons uh, field. So that's why we call this self-consistent field method. So again, in summary, you take a guess of phi 1 and phi 2, use them to make the total wave function psi. Given psi, you can evaluate, you can simplify the potential energy of electron 1 fields and that electron 2 fields. And they are operators as well. Effective potential energy operator for electron 1 contains the coordinates of electron 1 and electron 1 only. The effective potential energy operator for electron 2 contains the coordinates of electron 2 only. And that's why we can solve this to one electron shorting equation. And once we do that, we get a new set of phi 1 and phi 2. And we repeat this iterative self-consistent field method until the convergence is met. Uh, what if you have a lithium atom? Uh, it's the same. You have three electrons in the lithium atom. So you have to make a guess of uh, three wave functions, one for each electron, phi 1, phi 2, and phi 3. And then you use phi 1, phi 2, phi 3 to make a determinant as the total wave function of the three 
<coughs> electrons. <coughs> so this normalization factor will be 1 over the square root of 3 factorial. And then you will have 3 rows. Row 1 for electron 1, row 2 for electron 2, and row 3 for electron 3. And then you have 5, 1, 5, 2, 5, 3 as the 3 columns. So you will have to somehow estimate or just guess uh, what the 1s orbital looks like, uh, what, what the 2s orbital looks like. <clears throat> and then you can use the total wave function to get the effective potential energy operator for electron 1, for electron 2, for electron 3. And then you solve the three Schrodinger equations, one for each of the three electrons. And then you get a new set of 5, 1, 5, 2, and 5, 3. And then you repeat this procedure until this uh, effective potential energy operators for the three electrons uh, reach convergence. Uh, what if you have 118 electrons in an atom or very large molecules, a uh, molecule that contains, for example, a million electrons? Well, simple. You just need to make a guess for this 118 electrons. You need 118 phi's from phi 1, phi 2, all the way to phi 118. And then you make a determinant, a 118 by 118 determinant. That's your total wave function. Use that, you will be able to get the effective potential energy operator for each of these 118 electrons. And then you solve uh, 118 short equations, one for each electron. And you keep uh, repeating this procedure until uh, the uh, convergence is reached. For a molecule, same thing. You just look at the number of electrons. Uh, that's the same as the number of Schrodinger equations you need to solve. Uh, now let's talk about exchange energy, a very important concept in quantum mechanics. Uh, you do not see exchange energy in classical physics. When you have two or more electrons with the same spin, because they have the same spin number, they cannot have the same, they cannot occupy the same spatial orbital. All right, so this is Pauli, uh, Pauline exclusion principle. And because of that, uh, the repulsion between two electrons with the same spin is less than the repulsion between two electrons with the opposite spins. Why? Because if you have two electrons with the opposite spin, uh, let's say in a helium atom, you have an alpha electron, you have beta electron. These two electrons have the opposite spins, and they can occupy the same spatial orbital, right? So they can both occupy the 1s orbital. So that means the repulsion between the two electrons with different spins have larger repulsion than two electrons with the same spin. Again, if you have same spin, they cannot occupy the same spatial orbital. So on average, the distance between two electrons with the same spin is greater than the average distance between two electrons with the opposite spins. All right. So consequently, if you have two electrons with the same spin, they have lower repulsion energy than two electrons with the opposite spins, assuming all other conditions are the same. The lowering of the repulsion energy between electrons with the same spin is called exchange energy. That's why uh, exchange energy is always negative, because you have lower repulsion between the two electrons with the same spin, and we say the exchange energy is negative. It lowers the total energy of this many-electron system. <laughs>